Audiobook Title Mix Audiobook Collection July 7, 2023 System vs. Rebirth Chapter 766 Competition The next day, Noel and Anna stood on the field. They were demonstrating the result of their training. Good. Old Rue nodded, satisfied. To think you would be able to do it within such a short period, even I'm impressed. Still, it's too far from the usable level. So, for the next training, Old Rue pointed at Noel. Now that you have managed to control your spiritual energy all around your body, concentrating it in one spot should be possible, right? Yes. Noel nodded. Then, try to gather the spiritual energy in your hand. Noel raised his hand and enveloped it with a thin layer of spiritual energy. Raise the output. Noel poured more and more, inflating the layer and making it look like a glove. That's the level. Your task today is to inflate the layer until that level. But while doing so, you are going to touch her. Old Rue stated while pointing at Anna. Touch her? Noel looked at him with a disgusted face. I'm not talking about that. Old Rue shook his head. Instead, I want both of you to extend your hands and feet so that you touch each other. Noel will be inflating the energy and Anna is going to match it. This will test your reaction speed and train your speed in controlling your spiritual energy. And because your control only allows you to maintain it for a few seconds, you have to match the energy until your control deteriorates. Once you've lost your control, the other party will be the one attacking this time. Understood? Noel and Anna looked at each other. They couldn't help but remember what would happen if they failed to match it. The burst of spiritual energy would definitely blow them away. Anna thought this was a way to avenge the shame she suffered yesterday. She would definitely make Noel suffer here. Meanwhile, Noel also had his evil thoughts in this training. Noel and Anna had evil smiles on their face as if indirectly telling each other that they should prepare for what was coming. Youth, huh? Old Rouge shook his head helplessly. Despite trying to best each other and making all sorts of competitions, these two have a pseudo-boundary to the point where I don't know whether these two are a couple or not. No, why haven't they become a thing already? Either way, it's good that they come together since the training will be much easier that way. Their little competitiveness will definitely speed up the progress. Old Rue decided not to say anything about their relationship. They could be said to be best friends, but the boundary was so thin that one would definitely mistake their relationship. Before leaving them alone, Old Rue reminded them. One more thing. I think you already know this, but you can continue the practice anywhere you want, including your room. In fact, that's the reason why you're staying in one room. However, you have to remember one thing. You two better not destroy anything in my house. The smile on the two youths' faces disappeared as old Rue's cold voice sent chills down their spines. Yes, sir. Good. You may start. I'll observe you for an hour or so. Then you can do the rest. Noel and Anna nodded. They faced each other before sitting down on the ground. They extended their hands and feet so that they touched each other. Then, both of them started closing their eyes, trying to feel the spiritual energy. Noel took a deep breath as he first wrapped his entire body with a layer of spiritual energy first. After that, he began to shift the amount of energy to his right foot, inflating the amount of energy. Before, 100% energy was used to wrap his body. But after the change, he poured only 70% of the total energy into his body while the remaining 30% was used to power up his right foot. Anna immediately sensed the change in spiritual energy. She had circulated her spiritual energy, so she hurriedly proceeded to shift the energy to match Noel's level of energy. But by rushing it to avoid getting blown away, she poured a little too much, causing the balance of spiritual energy to change. In that instant, Anna's energy began to overwhelm Noel's energy, releasing a small shock wave that knocked his foot back. Ah, Noel gritted his teeth while opening his eyes. His body got stretched a bit because of the shock wave. Oops. That was unintentional. Anna made an awkward smile. No, that must be intentional. Noel glared at her. In that case, Anna is the one losing. Remember, you have to match the other party's energy completely. Old Rue smirked and took out an ink. By the way, this is an ink and a brush. The ink can be washed away with simple water, so you don't have to worry. You can give one stroke to the loser. This should be perfect for your little competition, right? Anna gasped. Wait, that one doesn't count. Shut up. Just accept your fate. Noel didn't wait as he grabbed the brush. He held her hand so that she couldn't escape. Then, he made a straight line on her right eyebrow as though he wanted to draw glasses. Cage. Let's start again. It's my turn. Anna hurriedly concentrated, trying to pay him back. Anna poured some spiritual energy into her left hand this time. Noel didn't want to lose, so he hurriedly matched it. But because of the competition, he got distracted a bit, 
and ended up rushing, causing the balance to shift. Anna got pushed back, but a smile appeared on her face. This time, it's your turn. She didn't hesitate to grab the brush and make a line on his cheek. I'm going to make you a cat today. Just try it. Noel glared at her. He was starting again. The training might look distracting, but the desire to not want to get the punishment would make them strive to improve. And their little competition was what made this type of training even more effective. Old Rue was just smiling on the side, watching their interaction before eventually leaving those two alone. Chapter 767 Second Phase Ha ha, you are extremely funny right now. Anna laughed out loud while pointing at Noel. The dusk had arrived and they were about to return and continue their training in their room. So, they took one last look at each other, appreciating the work they had created. Anna couldn't contain herself when she saw everything she had painted on Noel's face and body. They had been trying to outsmart each other, causing the spiritual energy manipulation to become even more ridiculous. But the reason why Old Rue suggested this method was actually because of their competitiveness. They had been battling each other in spiritual energy control at a far higher level than what Noel could do if he was only with Dimitri or Damien. The reason why Anna couldn't contain her laugh was because Noel's forehead had cute written on it. I am was written on his right cheek, and weak was written on the other cheek. There were even some cat whiskers on it. But because there were too many things to write, they moved toward arms and legs to compensate for it. On Noel's left hand, Anna had put I love Master Anna. On his right hand, Anna made a drawing of him prostrating in front of her, but only with a stickman figure since she couldn't draw. It was humiliating for Noel. Even though he tried his best to match her movement, he failed at least more than 300 times today. Of course, Anna also lost the same number. As a result, Noel had paid her back. He had written ugly, stupid, and bad on her face alongside glasses and a black eye. On her hands there were words such as not wife materials and single for life on her as if he was cursing that her bad behavior would cause her to lose the opportunity to marry someone in this life. They had been clashing since the morning and it was truly an enjoyable and frustrating time. Due to their lack of control, they ended up taking some rest to consolidate it during their competition. Without them realizing it, the battle that was supposed to last only for three seconds had increased drastically. In the last battle, Noel managed to block Anna's advance for almost a minute. Old Rue had told them that they had to keep up with the control for at least 30 minutes to be able to use it in battle. But due to this competition, it seemed that they would be able to achieve their objective in less than a month. Even Old Rue wouldn't expect something like this. Shut up, you ugly. Noel snorted. No wonder you still haven't had an engagement. Your bad personality remains. What is this? My cute Noel is trying to argue or something? Anna smirked, teasing Noel. I am not arguing. I am simply telling you that there won't be anyone who will be with you. In fact, besides me, have you even got close to another man? Noel snorted. Eh? Anna widened her eyes in amusement. Are you say? Before she finished her words, Noel suddenly injected spiritual energy and pushed her back due to the imbalance. You lost. Noel harumphed and grabbed the brush. What? We have finished our training for the day. Why did you attack me again? Anna gritted her teeth and tried to grab the brush. But Noel skillfully avoided it and made a last long stroke on her hand. What? It's time for me to pay. Anna wanted to channel her spiritual energy. But Noel had retracted his hands and feet away. We're done here. Noel stood up, acting as if nothing happened. What? You cheater. You made one more turn than me. Anna gritted her teeth and tried to grab Noel's hand trying to do the same. But Noel hurriedly waved his hand, knocking her hand back. Noel and Anna looked at each other for a second. After that, Anna tried to grab Noel's hands with all her strength, but Noel kept repelling her and even moving toward the house. You bastard. Is this how a noble act? You can't even be fair. Anna kept chasing him. I'm a commoner, not a noble. They kept clashing until they reached the house where Old Rue made them promise that nothing should happen in the house other than in their room. And it seemed that Noel had taken the victory for today, albeit with a little bit of cheating. Anna was glaring at him the whole time, not liking how he had attacked her earlier. Of course, the fight continued the moment they returned to their room. Noel tried to stop her, but it was impossible since they were in an enclosed space. In addition, it was better to train whenever they had time for it. In the end, they continued their battle until they fell asleep with all those markers on their bodies. Both of them might not realize it but their relationship had changed a little bit ever since the previous incident at the campsite. However, the subtle change was very obvious. Of course, Dimitri and Nicole didn't have any intention of stopping them. 
It was the first time Nicole saw Anna being that happy when she trained and played with someone else, and Dimitri was gratified that there was at least someone who could make Noel relax. While they were observing how they trained, they continued to support them so that they didn't have to do anything other than train, eat, and sleep. This was how they acted most of the time. Eventually, they reached the state where they managed to last for an hour within one week, and old Rue gathered them again as it was time to move to the next stage. It seems that you two have got your fun. Old Rue smiled, looking at Noel and Anna, who appeared tired from fighting each other. We still have a lot of energy to spare. Noel and Anna said the same thing. Of course, it's time to continue to the next stage. You are to infuse your element into your energy. This is going to be a bit more intense, so start off slow. Chapter 768 Reason Before that, can I ask something? Noel raised his hand. Sure, there is something bothering me. It feels like we've been progressing extremely fast. Originally, we were planning to stay for four months and expected that we would return without the full training. Are you asking why you can progress this fast? It's pretty simple. The rivalry between you two is sparking the competitiveness you have in your heart. This is the reason why I put you in one room. Though, it seems that you haven't used the items inside the room at all. What do you mean? Noel tilted his head in confusion. I was preparing only one set of items, because I thought you would be infusing your energy into that item, preventing your partner from using it. Noel and Anna gasped, realizing what they had been missing so far. Not only the item but even the bed might also be possible. If they could somehow do it, they would definitely annoy the other. However, that's not possible anymore. Old Rue smiled, stopping them. Once you begin infusing your elements, it's going to be destroyed by your elements. That's... Noel and Anna exchanged looks. It seemed they had reached a tacit understanding. But that was the fact that they wouldn't back down. We can just infuse pure spiritual energy in it. This will definitely help with the second training. Noel explained. That's right. We could do the third training in the field while the second training in the house. This way, we can utilize our time effectively. Anna nodded in understanding. Ha! Ah. Old Rue laughed and teased them. Even though you always bicker with each other, there is a time you are agreeing with something, huh? Noel and Anna looked away, not admitting it. All right. This old man won't be teasing you two anymore. Old Rue raised his finger. I don't mind how you use your time during the night as long as you don't harm the house. Still, you haven't answered my question. No, you misinterpreted my question. Noel waved his hand, stopping him. Although I don't want to admit it since it makes me look arrogant. Our current pace should be enough to complete all the training while having some time to spare, right? Uh, I understand what you want to ask. Old Rue nodded. The third phase of the training is elemental training. The fourth phase is battle. The last phase is a test. If I look at your current speed, you should be able to complete the training within two months. Are you wondering what you can do in the remaining two months? Yes. Noel nodded. On the one hand, since he had fulfilled the objective, he would return. On the other hand... It would be such a waste to return just like that. Anna also agreed with Noel. She felt their time could be used more effectively. In that case, you can hunt the demons around here and take their crystals. You are currently spirit masters. Although you've gotten quite strong, your spiritual energy reserve is not at the level where you can reach spirit grandmasters within a short period of time. In this region, there are a lot of powerful monsters, especially peak level demons and even superior demons. You can hunt them and increase your spiritual energy reserve. This way, by the time you reach your home, you should be at the peak of Spirit Master. After consolidating your power, it won't be weird for you to reach the Spirit Grandmaster stage. Noel thought for a moment as if he was assessing the pros and cons of that schedule. Meanwhile, Anna asked a question. By the way, you told us that you would like to ask us something after you finished training us. Oh, old Rue had observed them and made a decision. It seemed that they had come here knowing about it as well. So, he decided to reveal his request. My request is simple. I hope that you don't take my grandson away. Hmm? Noel raised his eyebrows while Anna made a wry smile. As I said, something that must happen will happen unless you change your perspective. Within that calculation, your arrival here should be something that must happen. Once I think about it, I've come to realize that my grandson will be on it as well. Old Rue explained. That's... Anna scratched the back of her head. Since you've made such a request, I don't think it's right to hide it from you. Actually, your grandson is extremely talented in swords and can become the sword saint's disciple. I don't know if you know about him though. The sword saint, is it the one from 1000 years ago? Do you know him? There were legends about him even in my kingdom. Back then, both human kingdoms and my kingdoms were still connected, you know. 
I don't know much about the past, but I know who you're talking about. Then, Anna's expression brightened. My grandson is indeed talented. However, I don't think I want to let you bring him away for two reasons. Now that you have changed your perspective, I don't think letting him leave is a good option. You can consider this as a price for taking my lesson. As for the second reason, I'm just worried about his safety. Old Rue smiled. Noel and Anna looked down, thinking about it. They could somehow understand that because there were a lot of changes happening all around the kingdom, the situation would be unpredictable. Even with Anna's knowledge, it might still be hard to protect themselves. Still, it was a shame that the sword saint couldn't find a successor. Sir, Noel wanted to suggest that he left the inheritance here so that his grandson could receive it, but old Rouge shook his head. It seemed that he didn't want both of them to be connected to his grandson more than this. So, Noel could only respect his choice. I understand. I'm sorry for all this inconvenience. No, it's fine. Rather than that, how about we begin the training? Noel and Anna nodded. Chapter 769 Third Phase Noel and Anna closed their eyes and focused on channeling their energy to each other. Noel was the first one to concentrate his spiritual energy on his right hand. This time, he didn't push the energy or something to knock Anna back. Instead, he waited for Anna to match it. Due to the previous training, they had quite a mastery in handling this power. So, Anna easily matched the amount of spiritual energy on his right hand. After that, Noel said I'll begin, go on. Anna nodded. As soon as he got the confirmation, Noel began to infuse ice elements into his palm. He didn't dare to use the fire element because the undying flame might burn Anna. Even if the other party was confident in repelling it, and old Rue was here, one single incident might leave a permanent mark on her skin. Even with their competition, Noel would make sure that no harm was done to Anna. The blue spiritual energy gradually moved to the hand, emitting a chilling wind. Anna furrowed her eyebrows, asking, Are you not going to use your fire? Do you think I don't have the ability to fight that stronger element? Not at all. Is it wrong that I'm concerned about your well-being? After hearing that reply, Anna couldn't help but fall silent. She let out a sigh and said in that case. Anna started sending forth her lightning element to match the amount of ice element. As expected, since there were two elements coming from two different people, they would begin to clash the moment they encountered each other. The lightning was trying to shatter the ice, while the latter decreased the temperature drastically to freeze the lightning itself. However, they heard Old Rue warning them, proceed even more slowly. The lightning will become the river basin while the ice would melt and become the water flowing through that river. Anna followed his instruction. She tried to disperse the lightning evenly and tried not to fight back. Because of that, she had to reverse the lightning current, following the ice element current. Noel soon found that the resistance was gone, allowing his ice element to continue. Here I go. He warned Anna as she began infusing more energy to push the ice element. Anna felt the chilling ice element, and hurriedly reinforced her skin with another layer of spiritual energy. Surprisingly, the ice element flowed smoothly on her arm and was about to reach her body. Remember, don't let the energy penetrate your body. Element can only be countered by element, and spiritual energy can only be handled by spiritual energy. Disperse your lightning to protect your body from the chill and let the spiritual energy guide it. Old Rue instructed. Anna hurriedly covered her entire body and face with a thin layer of lightning element. As Old Rue said this would act as a tube where the ice element flowed. At the same time, she used spiritual energy to guide the fuel of the ice element, which was Noel's spiritual energy, forward. Carefully and slowly, Anna moved the ice element across her body until it reached the other shoulder. Once it passed her body, everything went even smoother. Anna only needed to match the amount of spiritual energy of the one flowing on her body. Then, Noel did the same to receive his energy back. Take this back, said Anna while checking whether Noel had matched her spiritual energy or not. If he hadn't done it, she would have had to slow down the flow. However, Anna was quite shocked by Noel's recent improvement. The more he trained, the faster his progress speed became. It felt like he got constant enlightenment. It was quite surprising that his perception was already at the same level as hers. If this continued, it wouldn't be long before he surpassed her. But for the time being, Anna wanted to complete this circulation first. The moment the ice element returned to his hand, Noel immediately reabsorbed it back into his body. Who? Noel felt relieved that the process was smooth without any problems. They gradually opened their eyes, staring at each other. It's smooth, right? Noel asked. Yeah, it's kind of cold though, but it will be the same for your lightning. I might get electrocuted, or the spark will jolt my body and give me some sensation of pain. Noel shrugged. Fair enough. 
Old Roo smiled and clapped his hands. Good. Both of you have done well even though this is only your first time. You have allowed your energy to enter her body and return it back to the original owner. Noel and Anna's eyebrows twitched as they complained about the same thing. Why did you make it sound lewd? Did I? Old Roo chuckled. In any case, this is what you're going to expect from this training. You will circulate your energy in succession. If you become the master of your energy, you will be able to protect your body without feeling anything. If I'm not wrong, you have used an ability to cut the spiritual energy, right? Old Rue turned to Noel. Yes. Noel nodded. How about using it to cut her lightning? Noel glanced at Anna, wondering if she was up for it. Here I go. Anna turned out to have stood up, looking very eager to do it. As soon as Noel stood up and raised his stance, Anna pointed her finger at him and shot out a lightning bolt. Noel sliced the bolt of lightning in half easily with his spirit weaponry. Excellent. Now shoot that lightning bolt at me. Old Rue nodded. Anna followed his instruction and released the same lightning bolt. Old Rue extended his hand and accepted the lightning bolt through the same technique. In that instant, the lightning bolt circled around his arm and gradually moved to his body as if it was trying to explore a new place. It moved fast and played around happily before Old Rue released it into the air through the other hand. However, one thing was clear. Old Rue could actually control Anna's lightning even though he didn't have that element. Did you see it? Old Rue smiled. Weapon Seller in the World of Magic Chapter 426 The Flames of War The Phoenix Empire Battles the Western Yen Here, you know the prices and I leave all the managing to you. It's your wish on how many servants you want to hire and how much salary you will give them. I'm allotting a maximum of 500 gold coins for the salaries. As for Meng Tao, he is already hired as the assistant manager and his salary is percentage basis just like you. It's just that you will get 2% and he will get 1%. Depending on the earnings and the sales, you might get a bonus or a salary hike. The most important rule you will have to remember is that you have to sell it from the store just like how we do here. I will you the best of luck in your new journey, Changbo. Meng Tao, I hope you two will do your job without disappointing me. After reminding him what he needed to know, Mark gave a send-off to Changbo and Meng Tao. As a result, Alan returned to his original job, although there won't be any customers for a while for the android to sell the weapons. A couple of days later, the preparations for the coronation ceremony of Western Yan's new king are going in full swing. The kings of the Eastern Sun and Western Moon have already confirmed their participation. On that day, they will gift the new king with their formal acknowledgement. As for the other empires in the continent, Chilin Empire and Kuen Empire outrightly rejected the invitation as they don't want to become the enemies of the Phoenix Empire. The Dwarven Kingdom cannot interfere in the matters of the humans. So, the dwarves will also be absent. The Leon Empire, on the other hand, either rejected nor accepted. The Emperor of the Shur Dynasty decided to wait until the Phoenix Empire finally acts. Depending on the result, they will change their stance. But spiritually, the Emperor was on the side of the Western Yen as it would lessen the strength of the Southern Empire. And the main player, Shan Fu, gathered his three current generals, two retired generals of which one of them was reinstated as the stand-in for the Northern Army, sect leaders and their elders, elite adventure teams from various guilds, and finally, the three supreme realm experts, including Lan Ju aka Wu Wei Bao. While the army was slowly marching to the west, the three supreme realm experts flew at their respective paces and reached their destination in different time intervals. Lan Ju was the first to arrive there, and he didn't attack the soldiers on the front line. Instead, he zoomed past them and put up act with the gold dragon in the skies by the time the remaining two caught up with him after they casually attacked the enemy soldiers, standing in their way. As a result, Western Yen lost a couple of Lars systems, 7 rank 5 robots, more than 20 rank 3 robots and robot dogs, and roughly about 120 foot soldiers. Song Tai and Huang Ming reached Lan Ju who appeared to be on a stalemate with the dragon, as they were about to support him to slay the beast emperor. The Jing first warned them not to interfere in his battle and further reminded them to go on their way in order to fulfill their respective missions. According to what they have discussed earlier, Wu Wei Bao, Lan Ju, will handle the gold dragon while the remaining two supremes will take a Feng Wu, his guardian, and his contracted demon if exists. Following the plan, Huang Ming and Song Tai left the gold dragon and flew toward the palace. Surprisingly, no guards stood outside of the palace to even block their way. Adding on top of that, their senses cannot penetrate the building. The two experts assumed that it is probably done by the so-called Feng Wu's demon and further concluded that Feng Wu's soldiers were hiding in the palace to ambush them. However, with the two of them working together, 
they felt only a demigod has the power to defeat them. Hence, they confidently barged into the palace without caring whether there are traps or not. It was there they received another shock. The whole palace was empty. No soldiers were hiding. No maids, no Feng Wu, and no hostages either. Instead, they could only sense one presence. Huang Ming and Song Tai looked at each other and meaningfully nodded before going on their way to the courtroom, where they saw a handsome youth sitting on the throne and welcoming them with a smile. Hello there, my human friend said I should be courteous with the both of you. He asked me to give you a choice, especially for you, Mr. Song. So, here it is. Demon King Bale put forth an option before Song Tai as Mark thought that Song Yu would feel sad if her ancestor dies in the war. Surrender yourself and become our prisoner or be punished along with your companion. What will be your decision? Song Tai furrowed his brows in displeasure. We knew about you from the start, and we are here to kill you, demon. The demon king lets out a fake sigh and commented, each to their own decision. Nothing can be done about it. He stood up from the throne and his two opponents went into their battle stance. It was then Bao raised his hand and snapped his fingers with a smile on his face. The surroundings changed immediately to that of an endless barren land without anything else. The eyes of Song Tai and Huang Ming widened in great shock as they looked around. An illusion? Song Tai wondered out loud. Huang Ming shook his head in extreme seriousness. This isn't an illusion, brother Song Tai. This is called the domain. Domain? Song Tai's heart skipped a beat for a second and abruptly turned his head to look at his comrade. A demigod? As Huang Ming nodded seriously, Song Tai didn't hesitate to take out a bow staff from his storage ring and shocked his teammate as well as their enemy at the same time. A divine grade weapon? Huang Ming and Demon King Bale sounded at the same time. Placing the bow staff with a golden ring around its center firmly on the ground, Song Tai spoke, You underestimated the Phoenix Empire's imperial family. They might not have a strong expert within the army but there is a reason why the Shang Dynasty has been successfully ruling this southern empire for more than 1,780 years. Earlier, you gave me the option to choose. Now, I will give you a choice. Return to your underworld and sever your Khan. Ugh. Before he finished his warning, all of a sudden, a sharp pointy energy broad blade erupted from the ground and pierced Song Tai's body at an unimaginable speed. Upon piercing his body, the energy blade transformed into demonic energy and invaded his body, paralyzing him. Thud. The bow's staff fell to the ground and Song Tai was frozen like a statue before falling onto his back. Looking down at Song Tai, the demon king snorted, HMPF, a fool talking nonsense in the middle of a battle. You are the one who underestimated me. You should actually be thankful that my friend doesn't want you dead. Meanwhile, Huang Ming rushed towards Song Tai in a flash and grabbed the bow's staff and spoke to the weapon while creating an ether energy barrier around himself. I don't know your name but please grant us your strength. I request you to allow me to wield you for a while. The bow's staff glowed for a second and became lighter. At the same time, a divine energy shield was formed over him. Thank you. Huang Ming didn't waste in speaking dialogues and charged forward with the bow's staff. Bail looked untroubled. He calmly stared at the opponent as the latter reached him and swung down the bow's staff. Bail ducked in a timely manner and raised his right hand. Lightning bursts out of his palm in the form of a concentrated beam of energy, and struck the divine shield. The shield couldn't block Bale's attack and the lightning beam broke through his defenses, making a hole out of his chest in the middle. Bale fell onto his right knee. Clenching his fist, he tried to heal his wound by using ether energy but for some reason, the hole wasn't closed, and the blood continued to pour down. Pfft. The demon king broke out into laughter. Did you forget that you are in my domain? Here, I set the rules. And one of my three rules bans the healing altogether. Ha <laughs> ha. Huang Ming could only raise his head and look at the laughing demon in deep hatred. Chapter 1746 Baiting Immortals Chapter 1746 Baiting Immortals Lin Mu's hand left a trail of light, as the rune-shaping brush kept on making tens of runes in a second. Just a bit more, they're getting closer too. Lin Mu muttered to himself while keeping a part of his focus on the cultivators. He was close to finishing the sky co-grounding formation and only needed a little more time. Second after second passed, as Lin Mu's work approached completion. But the cultivators had sensed something strange by this time as well. A couple of kilometers from where Lin Mu, a pair of fourth tribulation stage immortals were hidden. They'd been silent for half an hour now. Daoist Jugu said to his companions, Yeah, they should have run away by now if they were able to. Daoist Rusha replied, From the scene we saw, the attacks were very strong. Do you think the survivor is injured and can't move now? Daoist Juga asked, a smile appearing on his face. 
probably, or they would have attempted to run. Even if they are strong, I don't think they'd be willing to fight multiple immortals at once, Taoist Rusha replied. True, Taoist Jugu agreed while his immortal sense spread around. He could pick up on multiple cultivators that were around him. He was someone who had refined his immortal sense more than others and thus had a better advantage. Though compared to Lin Mu it was still lacking and couldn't pick up on the formations that he was setting up. The others are still cautious and watching from afar, Taoist Juga stated. Hmm, that is expected. The clash earlier was quite strong. We couldn't estimate their cultivation bases either from the torrent of immortal chi waves that spread, Taoist Rusha replied. But I don't think they are that strong. Or even if they are, they've expended most of their energy. He added, I think so too. Taoist Jugu agreed. Plus, if we attack first, we'll have the advantage. He spoke. What do you think? Should we let the others go ahead, or take the chance ourselves? Taoist Rusha asked, though internally he was tempted to jump the gun. Well, the early bird gets the worm. Taoist Jugu stated. It'll surely add to our contributions for the rewards if we defeat someone this strong. He added. Yes, a smile of greed appeared on the face of Taoist Rusha as well. They too never thought that this was exactly what Lin Mu had wished for. He had already known that if multiple immortals attacked at once, they might have a harder time. But if only a couple of them approached at a time, they would be able to handle them a lot more effectively. Plus, he also knew that it was unlikely for others to make teams bigger than two members. They wouldn't be able to trust each other after all since they didn't know who was going to be the winner in the end. With limited positions and no knowledge about the spatial planes closing, they only thought about there being two positions for the winners. This lack of information also factored into Lin Mu's plan. Whoosh. Having come to an agreement, Daoist Jugu and Rusher didn't waste a moment and rushed to the site of the battle. So they finally couldn't resist, huh? Lin Mu sensed two individuals approaching at high speed. His hand didn't stop moving despite that though and he continued to make runes. He possibly had less than a minute or maybe just a few tens of seconds before they would reach him. His mind didn't waver though and his focus prevailed. Shwa shwa. Two silhouettes could be seen in the sky, coming towards them. With every second, they covered large tracts of the area before finally, they were just at the edge of the circle that Lin Mu had set up. Hong. But just as they were about to enter it, Lin Mu's hand stopped moving. Walla. The entire area hummed with energy but wasn't felt beyond its boundaries. A large formation was completed and quickly activated on its own. Daoist Rusher and Zhuge who had smiles on their face while thinking about a weak target, were quickly changed. Huh? Aaaa. As soon as they were within the limits of the formation, their ability to fly was gone. What the hell? Daoist Zhuge shouted. Why can't we fly? Daoist Rusher tried to mobilize his immortal chi to propel him, but he couldn't. It was as if the immortal chi around them was not willing to listen to their commands. Shit! The two plummeted from the sky, quickly reaching the ground. Thud thud. Crack. Two depressions were left on the ground, as the two immortals crashed into the ground. A loud sound was also heard, while the two let out grunts of pain. Ugh. Daoist Juga held his arm that ached. Damn this. Daoist Rusher on the other hand bled from his mouth, the impact having hit in the worst. The two wouldn't die from falling from a height like this, but they certainly would sustain injuries. Normally this could have been avoided if they quickly mobilized their immortal chi to defend their bodies. But the sudden change and stopping of the immortal chi had left them surprised. It led to them not reacting fast enough, and falling without their defenses ready. It was a momentary lapse of judgment like this that had gotten them injured. Though it was also normal that they had not expected this. After all, formations that could restrict the flight of an immortal were limited. The one in the capital city and the tournament rings were expected. After all, they were set up by experts and were there for security. They would have never expected a complex formation like that would be set up in the spatial plane. No one in their sane minds would try it either, as it was too difficult to make and would take a lot of effort. Plus there was always the chance of getting caught while making it, and then being knocked out by surprise. It was also something that took up a lot of immortal chi, and one might spend more immortal stones in making it than they would make from this round. Overall, it was not a trade-off that one would want to make. Of course. No one would factor in the fact that a specialized Dao embryo would be used for it, and a faster version of the formation would be made. The Sky co-grounding formation had already been modified by Lin Mu to be able to be deployed faster due to his experience with making the Diamond Mountain Talismans. He had gotten used to making complex formations and could now apply it to others as well. It's a trap, Daoist Jugu and Rusher quickly understood. After all, they might have been caught off guard, but they were still immortals who had reached this far. 
They wouldn't have been able to do this if they were stupid. Do we retreat? Daoist Rusher was conflicted. The earlier battle might have been a bait to attract the cultivators. He expressed his doubts. No, it'll be too disadvantageous. Our positions are already revealed to both the cultivator who set this trap up and the others who were behind us. Daoist Juga said while gritting his teeth. We need to do this no matter what now. Daoist Rusher frowned, but knew that his companion was right. They had taken a risk and now they needed to bear the consequences of it. I guess we just need to get rid of the person who set this trap up. A formation like this would have drained them of a lot of energy. We might still have a chance, Daoist Rusher said after thinking for a bit. Daoist Juga just gave a simple nod before rushing towards where he could feel a few immortal chi fluctuations. He knew they had already lost the advantage of surprise and needed to be as quick as possible. Daoist Rusher did the same and the two rushed towards where the immortal chi fluctuation were coming from. Shua. But unknowingly they stepped on a befuddling formation that subtly changed their directions. Thud thud. Then with my immortal sense, someone has set up an entire illusory array to hide everything. He started to realize they might ug. Daoist Rusher and Juga ended up crashing into each other. Shit. There are more traps. Daoist Juga realized. I can't sense them with my immortal sense. Someone has set up an entire illusory array to hide everything. He started to realize they might have misjudged from the start. There sure are. A low voice spoke from behind them. Shing. Who? Daoist Juga didn't even realize before a sword slash struck him. ARGH, he cried in pain, and a long cut appeared on his shoulder. Ambush. Daoist Rusher tried to respond but didn't expect another attack to come from his back. Arg. This time blood spilled from his waist, as a spear was stabbed into it. Time to end it. Qianwen said quickly using a chi skill while the two were distracted. Chapter 1747 Four Immortals Down Chapter 1747 Four Immortals Down Daoist Rusher and Daoist Juga had never expected their luck would be this bad. Not only had they been forcefully grounded, they had also triggered traps, causing them to get befuddled and then be ambushed. If that was not enough, the ones who had attacked them were two third tribulation stage immortals too. Lu Su had his spear stabbed into Daoist Reshi's back while Qian Wen swung his sword cutting into Daoist Juga's chest. Shua, Daoist Juga turned into a flash of light, as his identity token was destroyed from the attack. I should finish up too, Lu Su said before raising his palm. Flesh rumble palm. His palm looked to be normal, but a faint layer of white energy could be seen on it. Why you? Before Daoist Rusher could respond though he was struck by the palm in his abdomen. Cough. He spat out a mouthful of blood, from the impact. Lu Su's palm skill was not simple and could cause vibrations to travel through one's body causing them more damage than they might expect. It was especially bad when one was not able to keep up one's defenses. Daoist Rusher was also stuck in one place, due to a spear skewering him through his waist. Lu Su didn't stop there either and slapped his palm on the man several times, trying to hit the identity token. Crack. It took seven tries before the token finally cracked. Ha, huh, he hit it on his wrist. Lu Su was a bit surprised as it was a less protected area, but there's a part that others wouldn't target early on. He reckoned. Shua. And oh oh. Daoist Rusher turned into a flash of light before being teleported out of the spatial plane. Clunk. Lu Su's spear was freed in the process and hit the ground underneath it with a sound. We're done here, brother Mu Lin. Qian Wen informed seeing that Lu Su had defeated his opponent. Good. More should be coming soon. Lin Mu replied while observing everything. His attention was still split, but he had an easier time since he didn't need to work on the formations now. He only needed to split his immortal sense into two, one part focusing on his companions while the other was focused on the incoming cultivators. He didn't need to worry about the formations either, as they were working perfectly. If anything happens, I'll sense it quickly anyways. Lin Mu wasn't worried about that either. With the plan running, Lin Mu got ready for the action. Rotate according to the direction that the intruders come from. Lin Mu spoke to his companions. Yes. Ming Aolian replied while Ming Danden continued to work with the mulch crawl eater beast. The swampy ground ring they had made was narrow at the start, and they were now making it wider. The wider it was, the better their chances of catching stray immortals in it. Daoist Rusher and Jugu were unlucky enough to be wiped out before that, but there was no guarantee the same would happen to the others. There was bound to be a time when others would catch on to the traps. But for now, Lin Mu would take full advantage. Four minutes passed as a couple more cultivators built up the courage to come closer. Come on, come on, the bait is fresh. Lin Nu knew they wouldn't be able to resist for long. Shua, 
And sure enough, the next minute two more cultivators entered the ring. These were a bit weaker than before though being at the third tribulation stage of the immortal realm. Thud thud. And just like before, they were caught off guard and plummeted from the sky. Lu Su Qian Wen. Lin Mu transmitted the location of the intruders to the two. Already there? But the two had seen the sight of the intruders and were already there. Slick. Ha ha. I got one. Lu Su laughed as the unlucky one out of the two third tribulation stage immortals fell onto his spear. Arf. The man screamed in pain, not being able to register what had just happened. Off you go. Lu Su thrust his palm. Slap. Shua. The third tribulation stage immortal was knocked out immediately, causing the token to teleport him away. W who are you? The other third tribulation stage immortal that was left was stunned. He had just managed to raise his head from the ground when he saw his companion being defeated. Shing. But his words were only met by a sword slash. SSSS. The man hissed in pain, as the sword slash cut his thigh. He managed to dodge it. Xian Wen muttered as he saw his target move. Should I need to get away? The third tribulation stage immortal realized. He tried to fly, but couldn't thus he simply ran. But with the cut on his thigh, it was a difficult task, and every step was painful. Shua. But Lu Su was not one to let a target get away that quickly. Not so fast. Lu Su thrust his spear, striking the immortal square in the chest. Clang. But just before the spear could pierce his chest, the immortal used the chi skill. Ugh. The chi skill created a small shield on his chest that managed to block the attack. Whoosh. Still, the impact of the attack was enough for the man to be knocked away. Unable to control his momentum, the man fell to the ground again. Splat. But when he landed, it wasn't on solid ground. Mud? The man was in pain and confused. No swamp. He quickly realized that it was worse than he had thought. Having fallen from some height, his impact had allowed him to sink quickly. His body was already halfway into the swamp when he managed to prop up his head. If he had fallen head first, he might have choked on the mud perhaps. This one actually managed to reach the swamp ring. Lin Mu noticed from the center of the ring. Chapter 1748 Smooth Cooperation Lin Mu could reckon this third tribulation stage immortal had a bit of luck on his side to even last this long. But this is the last bit of his luck. Lin Mu said as he observed Lu Su finish the man off. Shua. His spear stabbed the man, injuring him as well as breaking the identity token on his body. With the second intruder teleported away, Lu Su and Qian Wen quickly returned to their positions. Looks like I got lucky this time. Lu Su chuckled. I'll pay more attention next time. Qian Wen wasn't one to back down either. Do you want to make a bet? Lu Su suggested. What kind of bet? Qian Wen asked. While he wasn't one to gamble, he wouldn't mind a friendly bet. The betting they were doing on the tournament didn't count since that was basically a calculated investment after Lin Mu's interference. Well, the one who defeats the most cultivators gets 10% of the other's profits from the wins. Lu Su replied. Hmm. Qian Wen thought about it for a moment. What if brother Mu Lin also joins it? Ming Danden asked hearing their conversions. Then there's no point in the bet. Ha ha. Brother Mu Lin will easily come out on top. Lu Su replied. The bet will be just among us. All right. Qian Wen agreed as the betting amount wasn't that big. Plus with how much they were going to receive, it wasn't that much of a difference. He also reckoned a friendly competition would only add to the fun of the tournament. I guess they're having fun. Lin Mu noticed the banter between his companions and the bet they decided on. He didn't mind it and let them do it. Shua. Not long after, he sensed two more cultivators approaching and alerted the rest. This time, Lu Su and Qian Wen were even more prepared and were already standing where the two fourth tribulation stage immortals would be entering from. Similar to before the two immortals plummeted to the ground. Who are they? One of the fourth tribulation stage immortals noticed them right from the sky. Lu Su tried to repeat his previous trick but was unsuccessful when his target suddenly changed the direction of his fall. Whoosh. The target used a movement skill that allowed him to momentarily step on air. This'll be a tricky one. Lu Su got ready for a proper fight. The second intruder though, wasn't as lucky. Qian Wen also didn't want to take chances and directly jumped into the air. Slash. His sword shone with a light before a sword imprint flew out. The second fourth tribulation stage immortal only managed to change his direction enough to avoid his vitals, but was still cut on his hand. Lu Su and Qian Wen quickly embroiled in short combat before retreating behind the swamp ring. These ones are a bit tougher, Lu Su muttered. We still have more chances, Qian Wen said as he watched the two fourth tribulation stage immortals pursue them. Two damned third tribulation stage immortals dare ambush us. You will suffer for this. 
the fourth tribulation stage immortals shouted in anger. But this also made them miss the fact that there were other traps in the area too. One of them stepped on it, and ended up suddenly turning around. Where are you going? His companion tried to stop him, but this opened up his back to another attack. Xing, slash, Lu Su and Qian Wen weren't one to miss an advantage like this, and quickly lashed out with their long-range attacks. The two fourth tribulation stage immortal got injured, and they realized there were traps here. Much to their surprise, they had walked into a trap again, sinking to their knees in the swamp. We need to be careful about the befuddling formations, the first fourth tribulation stage immortal stated. There might be other traps here too. The second fourth tribulation stage immortal said while continuing to walk. Splat. Much to their surprise, they had walked into a trap again, sinking to their knees in the swamp. Again, Lu Su rushed at the two immortals, sending several thrust attacks. The two immortals though managed to get out of the swap, since one of them could use a movement technique. Howl. But what they didn't know was that there were more people targeting them. Or rather, people and beasts. A wolf? By the time the first fourth tribulation stage immortal noticed the beast in the sky, it was already too late. Clang. Ting's claws struck his staff, sending him flying back. Thud. He slammed into his companions, knocking the wind out of his lungs. Need some assistance? Ming Aolian asked. Right on time. Lu Su replied with a smile. This should help us enough. The one attack from Ting was enough for Lu Su and Xian Wen to gain an advantage again. Shua Shua. A couple of minutes later, the two fourth tribulation stage immortals were defeated, their bodies turning into flashes of light. Any more incoming? Lu Su asked Lin Mu. Yes, just a minute away. Lin Mu replied while continuing to observe. Lu Su and Xian Wen got ready to be in position, while Ting flew high up into the sky. She was to swoop in when Lu Su and Xian Wen needed help. And just like this, the four companions of Lin Mu became better and better at cooperating. One after the other, teams of immortals started to fall under their combined attacks. An hour ended up passing like this, during which they had defeated about 16 immortals. But now, it looked like the rest had become cautious. It was bound to happen, I guess. Lin Mu noticed that the six remaining cultivators were actually backing away. It was expected since they had noticed other immortals go and simply disappear. It didn't take a genius to know that there was a trap hidden ahead. Should we coax them in? Qian Wen inquired. No, let them be. We got time. Lin Mu said as he sensed that the other spatial plane was still intact. Chapter 1749 A Strong Opponent Approaches With the initial defeat of the six cultivators, Lin Mu and his companions had a bit of a free time. Lu Su and the rest asked him what they should do, to which Lin Mu said they just needed to wait. They were in no rush, and Lin Mu would tell them when it was time for them to go on the offensive. Thus, for the coming few hours, they rested and recovered the immortal chi that they had used up. Lin Mu did the same, having used the most among them. After all, not only had he fought using his Tao skills, but he had also used the rune-shaping brush to make the sky co-grounding formation, along with several others. It had basically depleted his immortal chi to half. It was surprising how Lin Mu could use chi skills for a long time, but as soon as it came to Tao skills, his consumption would skyrocket. But then again, that was to be expected, as Tao skills were not something one was supposed to use right away. For most immortals, they were their trump cards or only used when they were at a disadvantage. If there was someone else using the Tao skills like Lin Mu had, they would have already used up all their immortal chi. After all, while the Tao skills were stronger when used with immortal chi than spirit chi, it didn't mean their consumption changed. Then there was the fact that they would also tire out the cultivator mentally. Using Tao's skills needed quite a lot of focus, after all. Lin Nu had a high capacity of immortal chi as well as a faster regeneration which was why he was able to bear the use. For him, the use of the true earth heart Tao embryo in the fight against the serene glass valley members wasn't that much. Most of his consumption had actually come from making the sky co-grounding formation since he not only needed to supply immortal chi to the formations but also to the rune, shaping brush when making them. This created a multi-channel drain on his immortal chi stores. But despite all that, he had only used half of his immortal chi capacity. And now, he was quickly on his way to restoring it to the maximum. Immortal stones and immortal chi pills are best used now. Lin Mu didn't shy away from using resources and consumed them freely. After all, this was the time to use them. He went through immortal stones at a great pace, while also absorbing the immortal chi from a pill that he had eaten. The twofold influx of immortal chi allowed him to replenish his immortal chi at a faster pace than before. 
Perhaps it was also the improvement of his body due to the progress of the tyrant bull marrow secrets that he was able to handle higher amounts of immortal chi at once. It wasn't just about the quantity either, but also the efficacy and speed at which they were absorbed into his body. With the twofold approach, Lin Mu quickly reached his optimum condition in a few hours. The other immortals didn't dare to approach them, and were actually a bit afraid. After all, they didn't know what exactly had happened as the others that had approached the area had simply disappeared. With the illusory array that had been set up by Lin Mu, it was as if they disappeared into thin air. Then there was the fact that no immortal chi fluctuations were felt either. Neither could they hear the sounds of any battle. It a stark contrast with the battle that had happened there previously. It didn't take long for the cultivators to realize that the former battle that acted like a beacon might just have been a bait for them. Someone had set up an array beforehand and orchestrated a battle to catch the attention of other immortals and make them tempted to attack. One could say half of this was true, but the timing of the array set up as well as the reason behind the formed battle were wrong. Though to Lin Mu, it didn't matter as all he needed was some more time. They'd either wait till the last spatial plane other than theirs closed or defeat all those that entered the array. It took an entire 12 hours before someone actually attempted to come close to the area. Oh? Someone knew this time. Lin Mu's immortal sense quickly spread and observed the people that had gotten closer. They were new and were not among the cultivators that had been watching earlier. Perhaps they stumbled onto the area recently, or had been waiting all this time. Lin Mu thought to himself, or they might have been sent by others here too. Lin Mu wouldn't ignore the chances of others collaborating either. Rather than collaborating, there might be threats involved too, or rewards from others, if they did this for them. Lin Mu could think of several scenarios. Regardless of what they might be though, he was ready for it all. Thus, when the new cultivators got close enough, he quickly alerted his companions. Get ready. Two more are approaching, this time from the position of Ming Danden. Lin Mu informed them through the communication jade slip. It's a pair of third tribulation stage immortals. He added, the cultivation base of the two immortals was why Lin Mu also considered the fact that they might have been coerced or threatened by the others to come. Third tribulation stage immortals were now the lowest among the bunch left in the spatial plane. The ones that were surviving now were either those that truly had skills, or were simply lucky. The ones that were lucky initially should have realized by now that winning this round might not be a big possibility for them. Thus, rather than just losing directly, they might as well collaborate with others in exchange for extra rewards. It was a reasonable approach and was not against the rules either. Schwa. A couple of minutes later, the two third tribulation stage immortals finally entered the limits of the array. Therein, Lin Mu alerted the others. Lu Su and Qian Wen quickly got to work, trying their earlier strategy. But this time it didn't work as well, as the two immortals weren't flying high. They were just a few tens of meters from the ground, allowing them to land safely. Still, Lu Su and Qian Wen didn't lose focus, attacking them according to the established tactics. They managed to deal a few blows to the two third tribulation stage immortals before they retreated. The intruders tried to rush after them, but were caught by the swamp as expected. With another opportunity for attack, Lu Su and Qian Wen injured them further. This put the two third tribulation stage immortals on the defensive, and they focused on surviving instead of attacking back. And when Ting finally appeared to attack, the two third tribulation stage immortals did something unexpected. They took out a communication jade slip. Lin Mu who saw this knew that his latter guess had been right. So they were indeed sent by others. Lin Mu understood. He also realized the thinking behind the intruder's attempt. They didn't inform the others immediately but only did when Ting appeared. I guess the thing that they wanted to know was whether there were more than two people collaborating in this. Lin Mu analyzed their thoughts. After all, more than two cultivators working together didn't really make sense. But since both Qian Wen and Lu Su had fought openly, it meant that the Sky Sore Wolf belonged to a third immortal. An immortal that was a beast tamer wasn't allowed to fight personally, which meant Ting didn't belong to Lu Su and Qian Wen. And if there was a third immortal involved, it also meant that a fourth might be present as well due to there being teams of two. One might even assume that this fourth person could be the one who had set up the formation array. Looks like they'll change their approach now. Lin Mu thought as he watched the two third tribulation stage immortals turning into flashes of light and being teleported away. Get ready, the next group of invaders will be more than just two. He informed his companions. We're ready. Lu Su didn't mind that they'll be facing more. It'll be the same, Qian Wen replied. I don't mind getting injured a bit more. We'll do our best to assist, Ming Danden chimed in. We just need to follow Brother Lin Mu's commands, and the plan will go well, Ming Aolian stated. 
Hearing their words, Lin Mu was pleased and liked their enthusiasm. But then, a few seconds later, his expression suddenly changed. Wait a second. Lin Mu felt a wave of energy coming from afar. It was beyond the range of his immortal sense, but could still be felt. A fifth tribulation stage immortal. Dragon Monarch System. Chapter 404 The Empire's Grand Gala. 2. A Tapestry of Envy and Longing. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention. I am honored to announce the imminent arrival of His Grace, Duke Marvin Sarlis. The Herald's solemn proclamation echoed through the Grand Reception Hall. The assembled nobles instantly fell silent, their conversations fading into the background. All eyes turned toward the entrance, eagerly anticipating the appearance of the esteemed Duke. It was none other than Duke Marvin Sarlis, a figure whose power and influence surpassed even that of Duke Sain. Duke Sarlis held a prominent position in the political fabric of the Eastern Empire, standing as the third most powerful figure after the Emperor and the royal family. The mention of his impending arrival heightened the collective sense of anticipation, as everyone understood the significance of his presence. Encountering Duke Sarlis was a rare privilege, reserved for only a fortunate few. Even securing an audience with him required careful planning and a week's notice, regardless of one's noble rank. The Sarlis noble house enjoyed unparalleled respect throughout the empire, occupying a position of great honor. For the lower-ranking nobles, simply catching a glimpse of Duke Sarlis was a remarkable blessing, an experience to be cherished. Witnessing his presence firsthand was a mark of distinction, affirming their own standing within the empire's intricate social structure. As the grand doors swung open, Duke Marvin Sarlis entered the hall, a figure of awe-inspiring stature. Donning regal attire that befitted his exalted position, he exuded an air of commanding authority that demanded attention. Every movement he made carried weight, and his mere presence seemed to fill the room with an undeniable aura of power. Silence descended upon the hall, as if the very air held its breath in deference to Duke Sarlis. The assembled nobles, captivated by his imposing presence, couldn't help but be overwhelmed with admiration and respect. The weight of his political influence resonated within their hearts reminding them of the immense sway he held over the empire's affairs. In that fleeting moment, the reception hall became a testament to the magnificence and grandeur of the Eastern Empire. It symbolized the convergence of noble power and influence, shaping the destiny of nations. Duke Sarlis stood as a central figure in this intricate web of politics, embodying the strength and noble heritage of the empire. Your Grace, it is an honor to be in your esteemed presence once again. Duke Sain addressed Duke Marvin Sarlis with deep respect and warmth. Approaching with elegance, he offered an additional glass of wine, a gesture symbolizing camaraderie and honor. Duke Marvin and Duke Sain, being neighbors and ruling territories in close proximity to the capital, often crossed paths. Their encounters were not only expected but also anticipated. Despite his youth and limited experience, Duke Zane held profound admiration and reverence for Duke Sarlis. He fully recognized the vast disparity in their power, prestige, and political influence. Standing in Duke Marvin's presence was an unparalleled honor that demanded the utmost reverence. Accepting the offered glass of wine with grace and humility, Duke Marvin conveyed his gratitude to Duke Sain through a subtle nod. This simple act underscored the significant gap in authority between the two dukes, reaffirming Duke Marvin's superior position in the eyes of all present. Duke Sain couldn't help but feel a mixture of deference and admiration as he witnessed Duke Marvin's acceptance. Duke Marvin epitomized wisdom and distinction, an authority figure whose influence extended far beyond their shared region. His presence served as a guiding light, commanding respect from all who beheld him. Duke Zane never considered himself on the same level as Duke Marvin, understanding that no other noble in the empire could rival his power, prestige, and political influence. Duke Marvin's impact on the Empire's affairs was profound and awe-inspiring, something beyond the comprehension of most. As the two dukes engaged in conversation amidst the splendor of their surroundings, the attending nobles observed with curiosity and awe. They recognized the significance of this interaction, witnessing a display of mutual respect and deference between two figures at the pinnacle of noble authority. The exchange between Duke Marvin Sarlis and Duke Sain offered a glimpse into the intricate workings of the Empire's noble hierarchy. It showcased the reverence commanded by Duke Marvin, emphasizing the weight of his authority and influence. For the onlookers, this conversation provided a modest window into the inner workings of the Empire's political landscape, where the interplay of noble personalities shaped the destiny of the nation. It served as a celebration of power, prestige, and influence within a noble society. Duke Sain playfully addressed Duke Marvin, your grace, you're late. 
What transpired to delay your arrival? Zayn knew that Marvin was usually punctual and wondered about the cause of his delay. Duke Marvin, with a composed and regal demeanor, smiled understandingly at Duke Zayn. I apologize for my tardiness, your grace. I had the honor of meeting with his majesty. We had important discussions, and time seemed to pass quickly. But the nobles who have been listening to their conversation now had a deeper understanding of Duke Marvin's power and influence. To be able to see the emperor before such an important event just shows how important Marvin was to this empire. There was another announcement made during Duke Sane and Duke Marvin's discussion with other nobles during this period. Esteemed guests, I kindly request your undivided attention. It is with the utmost honor and reverence that I announce the imminent arrival of His Most Royal Majesty, the Emperor accompanied by his esteemed fiancés. Immediately following the announcement, every nobleman in the room became extremely quiet. It was a pleasant surprise to see the nobles who were seated standing up in order to greet the emperor. There was a pause in drinking amongst the nobles who were drinking. There was a lot of seriousness in the air. Since it had been quite some time since they had seen the emperor last, this was their first opportunity to do so. With the crown of the Istarin Empire adorning his regal head, the emperor made his entrance into the grand banquet hall. His piercing blue eyes surveyed the vast expanse, taking in every detail with a calm and composed demeanor. The crimson regalia, a true masterpiece of craftsmanship, captivated all who beheld it. Its exquisite design, intricately woven with the utmost artistry, reflected the empire's authority, prestige, and majestic splendor. The name Crimson Regalia resonated with the rich hue that cascaded across its every curve, evoking a sense of profound reverence for the Istarin Empire. The crown's delicate filigree, meticulously fashioned from glistening gold, enveloped it in a lattice of breathtaking beauty. Each strand of precious metal seemed to possess a life of its own, intertwining flawlessly to create a harmonious pattern that exuded both strength and grace. As the golden framework glimmered in the ambient light, it cast a warm radiance, symbolizing the empire's enduring power and magnificence. Nestled within this golden embrace, a resplendent tapestry of gemstones elevated the crimson regalia to unparalleled opulence. The deep crimson rubies, reminiscent of the empire's noble heritage, shimmered amidst the dazzling array of sparkling diamonds. These meticulously selected jewels, embodying the empire's resplendent future, caught the eye and imagination of all who beheld them. Their brilliance, rivaling the stars themselves, illuminated the crown and bestowed an ethereal glow upon the regal surroundings. At the zenith of the crown, a majestic centerpiece emerged, a magnificent crimson starburst adorned with rare crimson fire opals. These fiery gemstones, vibrant and captivating, seemed to pulsate with an inner radiance, symbolizing the empire's unwavering power and vitality. The expertly cut and polished opals danced with an enchanting play of light, their flickering glow casting a spell over all fortunate enough to witness it. When placed upon the emperor's brow, the crimson regalia bore the weight of the empire's sovereignty. It embodied the enduring legacy of the Istarin Empire, an emblem of the ruler's authority and a testament to the empire's rich history and indomitable strength. Each facet and gemstone spoke of the empire's grandeur and the emperor's noble lineage, elevating his presence to celestial heights. Following in the emperor's wake, his future wives graced the room with their ethereal beauty. Each one was a vision of captivating allure their individual charms radiating like celestial beings descended from the heavens. As the doors swung open, it was as if the nobles present had been granted a divine glimpse of goddesses in human form. Their exquisite features, unique and incomparable, defied any attempt at comparison, for each possessed a beauty so extraordinary that choosing among them would be an impossible task. The nobles in attendance were left in awe, their hearts quickened by the presence of such enchanting goddesses. Each of the emperor's fiancées stood as a paragon of beauty, an embodiment of grace and allure. It was a privilege beyond measure to witness their ethereal presence, and the collective gaze of admiration and reverence followed their every step. In the presence of these celestial beauties, the grand banquet hall transformed into a sanctuary of mesmerizing charm and the realization of a dream. Gulp. The rumor of the monarch having a fiancé is something that I have heard before, but I would never have guessed that he already had four fiancés to his name. Why am I feeling jealous of the emperor all of a sudden? It is hard to believe that the emperor has such beautiful women to be his fiancées. In all my life, I have never been so jealous of anyone. This royal banquet is now starting to feel more like the emperor showing off his fiancées to everyone. All the nobles stood in stunned silence, their eyes fixated on the emperor's enchanting fiancées. Words escaped them, for they were captivated by the ethereal beauty that graced their presence. 
deep within the recesses of their hearts. A mixture of awe and envy swirled, for the nobles couldn't help but feel a pang of jealousy towards the emperor's incredible fortune. In their noble circles, finding a companion of such extraordinary beauty was already a daunting task. The quest to discover a woman who possessed both inner and outer radiance seemed like an unattainable dream. Yet, here they stood, witnessing not one, but multiple embodiments of perfection. The nobles' hearts resonated with a mixture of admiration and yearning, their desires echoing through the recesses of their souls. As they gazed upon the emperor's fiancées, envy flickered within their hearts like a smoldering ember. It was only natural for the nobles to long for the unparalleled beauty that graced the room. A sense of longing mingled with their jealousy, as they realized that the emperor possessed what seemed like an unattainable treasure. The companionship of goddess-like beings, each uniquely beautiful in her own right. The nobles couldn't help but be consumed by conflicting emotions. On one hand, they marveled at the emperor's remarkable fortune, his ability to secure the affections of these extraordinary women. On the other hand, they were reminded of their own limitations and the harsh reality of their quest for love and companionship. In their hearts, a mixture of admiration, envy, and a tinge of resignation blended together, shaping their emotions like the intricate threads of a tapestry. The room was enveloped in an electric atmosphere, charged with unspoken desires and suppressed envy. As the nobles struggled to conceal their emotions behind masks of composure, their gazes remained transfixed upon the emperor's fiancées. Each movement, each glance, and each subtle gesture captivated their attention, intensifying the throbbing ache within their hearts. In the presence of such unattainable beauty, the nobles felt a profound sense of their own inadequacy. They couldn't help but question their worth and desirability. Comparing themselves to the emperor and the seemingly insurmountable obstacles that stood between them and such breathtaking companionship. Though they tried to silence the voice of envy, it echoed through the chambers of their hearts, a reminder of the unfulfilled desires that simmered beneath their noble exteriors. Unspoken words hung heavy in the air, as the nobles remained transfixed, their thoughts consumed by a mixture of awe, envy, and admiration. Their silence spoke volumes, reflecting the depths of their emotions and the complexities of their desires. In their hearts, the nobles grappled with the truth, that finding beauty as resplendent as that which stood before them was an elusive dream, a yearning that might forever remain unfulfilled. In the grand banquet hall, a symphony of emotions played out, each note tinged with the bittersweet melody of unattainable beauty. It was a tableau that spoke to the depths of human longing, reminding the nobles that even amidst the pinnacle of power and privilege, the pursuit of love and beauty remained a journey fraught with uncertainty and unfulfilled dreams. Chapter 405 The Empire's Grand Gala 3 a symphony of allegiance. The noble guests were arranged in two symmetrical groups on either side of the grand hall, divided by a long, scarlet carpet that stretched toward the emperor's resplendent throne. With a regal and measured pace, the emperor, accompanied by his four captivating future wives, began their procession toward the elevated seat of power. Among the mesmerized onlookers stood Viscount Edward Ashford, his gaze fixed upon the ethereal beauty of the emperor's fiancées. Entranced by their enchanting presence, he seemed to drift into a daze, losing himself in their radiant allure. The subtle shift in his demeanor did not go unnoticed by his observant wife, who felt a pang of annoyance and jealousy. Pinch, reacting swiftly, she employed a subtle yet effective strategy to reclaim her husband's attention. A discreet pinch to his waist jolted Viscount Edward Ashford back to reality, his dazed expression replaced by an awkward smile as he redirected his focus to the emperor and his entourage. He understood the consequences of succumbing to such distractions, particularly in the presence of his ever-watchful and competitive spouse. Meanwhile, similar scenarios unfolded among other noble couples in the hall. The wives, unable to escape the comparison to the emperor's future wives, grappled with feelings of inadequacy. Despite their own considerable beauty, intellect, and accomplishments, they couldn't help but feel diminished in the presence of these otherworldly figures. Each noblewoman, renowned for her grace and elegance, found herself plagued by a lingering sense of inferiority that tainted the otherwise joyous occasion. In the midst of the opulent banquet, Duke Marvin observed the unfolding drama with a mix of satisfaction and curiosity. Having been informed of Julia's exceptional prowess in alchemy, he remained unaware of the identities of the other three extraordinary women chosen by the emperor. However, his extensive experience in courtly affairs led him to believe that these women, too, possessed exceptional qualities. As Duke Marvin contemplated the scene before him, a sense of relief washed over him. For years, he had been plagued by concerns over the dwindling royal family since the passing of King Ahmed's wife. The empire had teetered on the edge of uncertainty, 
its future hanging in the balance. But now, with the emperor's decision to take four fiancés, Duke Marvin found solace in the realization that the royal family was once again expanding. The prospect of a larger and more robust royal family alleviated Duke Marvin's worries. With four potential successors to the throne, the future of the empire seemed secure. The once fading dynasty could now flourish and ensure the continued prosperity and stability of the land. The grand banquet hall buzzed with envious whispers and flickers of hope. The noblewomen, though momentarily disheartened by their own perceived inadequacies, found solace in the knowledge that they were integral to the empire's tapestry. They possessed their own unique strengths and contributions, essential to the success and prosperity of the realm. Duke Marvin, the astute observer, recognized the complex interplay of emotions unfolding within the hall. Envy and admiration were juxtaposed with insecurity and hope. In the wake of these tumultuous sentiments, the noblewomen and their husbands pledged their unwavering support to the emperor and his chosen ones, determined to rise above their own insecurities and play their part in shaping the empire's destiny. As the procession continued down the carpeted path, the radiant presence of the emperor and his future wives symbolized not only their individual beauty and allure but also the promise of a brighter future for the entire empire. With measured steps, the emperor came to a halt before the majestic throne, an aura of regal power emanating from his presence. Rather than ascending the grand staircase leading to the ornate seat of authority, he turned to face the assembly of nobles that had gathered before him, his gaze sweeping across the expanse of the grand hall. In that pivotal moment, a collective reverence coursed through the noble ranks, prompting them to offer their heartfelt greetings to the emperor. The male nobles, their countenances radiating dignity and poise, bowed with unwavering precision, their bodies inclining deeply in a profound display of deference. Each motion carried an air of grace, as if choreographed with meticulous care, symbolizing their unwavering submission to the emperor's supreme authority. In contrast, the female nobles, resplendent in their resplendent gowns adorned with exquisite jewels, executed elegant curtsies before the emperor. Their movements were fluid and poised, reminiscent of blooming flowers gently swaying in the breeze. As they gracefully lowered themselves, their eyes averted in a respectful gesture, their curtsies epitomized a profound sense of admiration and reverence, an acknowledgement of the emperor's elevated status and their unwavering devotion to their sovereign. In unison, their voices resonated with a melodious harmony as they proclaimed in a formal and reverent tone, Greetings to your majesty. The words, uttered with utmost respect and humility, reverberated through the hall, carrying the collective sentiment of loyalty and allegiance that the noble assembly held for their emperor. As the male nobles gradually rose from their bows and the female nobles gracefully straightened from their curtsies, an atmosphere suffused with reverence and loyalty enveloped the surroundings. The nobles comprehended their place within the intricate tapestry of the empire's hierarchy and embraced the profound solemnity inherent in their interactions with the emperor. These rituals of deference were not mere formalities, but a profound expression of their unyielding loyalty and unwavering commitment to the imperial throne. Emerging from the shadows with an air of unassuming elegance, Watson, dressed impeccably in a distinguished butler uniform, approached the emperor's side. In his hands, he carried a delicate crystal goblet, brimming with a rich, ruby-hued wine, as if it were a vessel containing the essence of opulence itself. With a graceful bow, Watson extended the glass toward Emperor Adifier, his movements executed with the precision and finesse befitting a ceremony of utmost importance. The Emperor, attuned to the subtle cues of his surroundings, accepted the offering, his gaze acknowledging Watson's impeccable service. Raising the glass to his lips, Adifier took a small, measured sip savoring the velvety notes that danced upon his palate. A attention of every noble present. The grand hall fell into a hushed reverence. The rustle of elegant momentary pause ensued, as if time itself had paused to witness the emperor's actions. And then, with deliberate grace, he slowly elevated the wine-filled chalice, an action that instantly drew the attention of every noble present. The grand hall fell into a hushed reverence. The rustle of elegant garments, and the soft murmur of conversations fading into the background. All eyes fixated upon the emperor, their gazes reflecting a mixture of awe and curiosity. The simple act of raising a glass had transformed into a symbol, an unspoken proclamation that something of great significance was about to transpire. In that moment, the atmosphere hung suspended, as if the very air held its breath in anticipation. The noble assembly, their hearts aflutter with anticipation, awaited the words that would follow this momentous gesture. For in the realm of nobility, where every action carried profound meaning, the emperor's every movement had the power to shape destinies and stir the currents of intrigue. 
With his glass poised in the air, Emperor Adifir cast his gaze over the sea of noble faces, his eyes reflecting a blend of authority and warmth. A subtle smile curved his lips, an enigmatic expression that hinted at the weight of his words. And as silence enveloped the hall, he spoke, his voice resonating with a commanding yet gentle timbre, carrying his intentions to every corner of the room. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed nobles of the realm, today, as we gather in this grand banquet, I stand before you humbled and honored to address this esteemed assembly. It is on this auspicious occasion that we not only celebrate the prosperity of our great empire, but also reaffirm our collective commitment to its enduring legacy. In the presence of such distinguished company, I am reminded of the remarkable achievements we have accomplished together, forging a path of unity, progress, and prosperity. It is through your unwavering loyalty, dedication, and tireless efforts that we have reached new heights as a nation. Tonight, as we partake in this feast, let us also reflect upon the challenges we have faced and overcome. Our empire has weathered storms of adversity, emerging stronger and more resolute with each trial. It is a testament to our resilience, our ability to adapt and thrive in the face of adversity, that we stand here today, united and unyielding. Yet, as we revel in the glories of our past, we must not be complacent. The responsibilities that come with our privileged positions demand that we continually strive for progress and improvement. We must embrace innovation, nurture talent, and foster an environment where every citizen has the opportunity to flourish and contribute to the betterment of our empire. Furthermore, let us remember that our power and influence carry with them a sacred duty, a duty to protect and uplift those who are less fortunate, to ensure justice and equality prevail in every corner of our land. We must extend a helping hand to the downtrodden, provide solace to the afflicted, and empower the marginalized. It is through our collective compassion and benevolence that we can forge a society built on fairness, inclusivity, and compassion. Tonight, as we feast and revel in the company of our fellow nobles, let us embrace the spirit of camaraderie and unity that binds us together. Let this grand banquet serve as a symbol of our shared purpose, our unwavering commitment to the prosperity and well-being of our empire and its people. I express my gratitude to each and every one of you for your unwavering support, for your tireless dedication to our empire's cause. Together, let us continue to nurture a future where greatness thrives, where harmony prevails, and where our empire stands as a beacon of hope and inspiration to all. May our bonds grow stronger, our ambitions soar higher, and our achievements shine brighter. Long live our empire! Raise your glasses, noble friends, as we toast to a glorious future filled with prosperity, unity, and the enduring spirit of our great empire, resounded throughout the Grand Hall as the Emperor's commanding voice reverberated among the gathered nobles. It was a resolute declaration, a rallying cry that echoed with unwavering loyalty and unwavering devotion. In perfect unison, the nobles, their crystal-clear glasses glimmering in the warm glow of candlelight, raised them high in a gesture of profound reverence. As the Emperor's words lingered in the air, a palpable sense of unity and purpose enveloped the Grand Banquet binding the hearts and souls of those present. Their glasses, filled with the finest elixir of celebration, seemed to shimmer with the collective hopes and aspirations of an empire united. Each noble, from the seasoned veterans of courtly affairs to the rising stars of the aristocracy, held their glass with the utmost respect, knowing that this shared moment was a testament to their unwavering allegiance to the throne. And then, as if propelled by an invisible force, the nobles spoke as one, their voices harmonizing in a chorus of devotion. Long live our empire! Their words reverberated with fervor, the weight of history and the promise of a glorious future intertwined. At that moment, the grand hall seemed to come alive with renewed energy, the air crackling with anticipation. The words they spoke carried the weight of generations past, the echoes of triumphs and trials, and the unwavering spirit of the empire. It was a powerful affirmation, a shared commitment to the preservation and prosperity of their beloved land. As the echoes of their resounding declaration subsided, the nobles lowered their glasses with a sense of reverence and contentment. The bond between sovereign and subjects had been strengthened, the unbreakable thread of loyalty woven ever tighter. In this grand banquet, amidst the flickering candlelight and the opulence of the surroundings, the nobles reaffirmed their unyielding support for the empire and its revered leader. Their glasses, now empty but imbued with the collective spirit of their oath, stood as symbols of their commitment, a commitment to honor, protect, and uphold the legacy of their great empire. As the emperor gazed upon his loyal subjects, a smile graced his noble countenance. The resounding chorus of, 
had solidified the unity that would carry them forward, illuminating the path to a future filled with boundless possibilities. With hearts aflame and spirits alight, the nobles stood united, ready to face the challenges ahead and carve a destiny worthy of their illustrious heritage. For in this moment, as their voices merged and their glasses touched, the indomitable spirit of their empire burned brighter than ever before. Chapter 406406 The Empire's Grand Gala 4. The Echoes of Jealousy Today, esteemed guests, I am honored to make a momentous announcement, the emperor declared, his voice resonating throughout the Grand Hall. The gathered nobles, caught off guard by the unexpected revelation, couldn't contain their excitement. The notion of the emperor having not one, but four fiancés, had been shrouded in utmost secrecy, known only to a select few who resided within the Dragon Palace or the revered old palace nestled at the heart of Azure City. With great pleasure, I shall introduce my first fiancé, a lady of unparalleled beauty and noble lineage, Princess Julia Honored of the esteemed Honored Noble House. The Emperor proclaimed, his words enveloping the room. The reaction was palpable, evident in the widened eyes and stunned expressions of the nobles, their disbelief laid bare for all to see. Whispers rippled through the assembly, for the mention of the name Julia Honored carried great weight. She was no ordinary lady, but rather the illustrious goddess of alchemy, renowned throughout the continent for her ethereal allure and unmatched mastery of the alchemical arts. The Honored household had long been the gathering place for those in dire need of alchemical remedies, with people queuing for hours, hoping to catch a glimpse of the goddess herself and beseech her aid. Now, the revelation that the emperor had captured the heart of this revered deity sent shockwaves through the room. The nobles were acutely aware that the goddess's beauty surpassed any mortal comparison, while her alchemical prowess far outshone even the most brilliant minds in the field. Julia's mere presence commanded the desires of men across the continent, her hand in marriage a symbol of ultimate achievement, the pinnacle of their dreams. Yet, here stood their emperor, a living embodiment of their aspirations, having achieved what others only dared fantasize about. The nobles marveled at his extraordinary fortune, recognizing the rarity and significance of this union. In the wake of this astonishing revelation, the nobles' astonishment mingled with admiration, their thoughts racing to comprehend the implications of this momentous occasion. Conversations buzzed with a newfound fervor, as whispers and murmurs filled the air, echoing the shared sentiment of awe and admiration for their emperor's remarkable accomplishment. The atmosphere crackled with anticipation, as everyone eagerly awaited the introduction of the remaining fiancés, fully aware that the revelation to come would be nothing short of extraordinary. At this point, what am I even doing with my life and what is the point of it all? It's over. There is no turning back now. It's official. The emperor, indeed, stands as a man of unparalleled fortune, for the celestial forces have conspired to bestow upon him an enviable fate one that elicits admiration and marvel from all who bear witness to the extraordinary tapestry of his existence. While some noble instantly felt depressed hearing this, some on the other hand just accepted this fact. After all, Adifir was the best man Julia could ever find. Adifir took the Istaran Empire from a second-tier kingdom to a five-tier empire. In less than a year, he managed to expand the empire in every direction. The current empire had territories in all four regions of the continent. The emperor was also very handsome looking and also the most powerful fifth order cultivator on the planet. He was also the king of all dragons. He is the dragon monarch. He ruled over all dragons. No king emperor or man on this continent can compare to Adifir. Just like how all noblemen dreamed of marrying one of the goddesses and saw it as their peak ultimate dream, many noblewomen dreamed of becoming Adifir's wife and the empress of the Eastern Empire. Becoming Adifir's wife would mean that they would enjoy endless wealth, power, status, respect, and everything that a noble could ever wish for in their lives. As the news of the emperor's engagement spread among the gathered nobles, a mix of emotions swept through the crowd. Some felt a sense of disappointment, realizing their own unattainable dreams, while others gracefully accepted the reality before them. They understood that Adifir, a remarkable man in every sense, was the perfect match for Julia, the renowned goddess of alchemy. Adifir, driven by ambition and wisdom, had overseen a remarkable transformation of the Istaran Empire. In a short span of time, he had elevated the empire from a second-tier kingdom to a prominent five-tier power. His bold vision knew no limits, as he skillfully expanded the empire's territories in all directions, firmly establishing their presence across the vast continent. These remarkable achievements showcased his strategic brilliance and earned him widespread admiration. However, Adifir's greatness surpassed mere political prowess and territorial conquests. 
his strikingly handsome appearance possessed an otherworldly charm that enchanted all who beheld him. With his well-defined features and an undeniable air of majesty, he embodied the epitome of irresistible attractiveness, captivating the admiration and fascination of people of all genders. However, it wasn't just his good looks that made him respected and admired, but also his immense power. Adifia was incredibly strong, standing at the top of martial skill as a fifth-order cultivator, a rare achievement attained only by the most exceptional practitioners. But his influence didn't end there, as he also held the prestigious title of the Dragon Monarch, commanding all dragons with an authority that surpassed any king, emperor, or person on the entire continent. His unmatched strength inspired awe and reverence solidifying his reputation as an unstoppable force. Amidst the grandeur of the royal banquet, a symphony of hushed conversations enveloped the noblewomen, their voices laden with a blend of admiration and yearning. As they gathered in intimate clusters, their eyes flickered with a mixture of awe and envy, their hearts alight with a fervent desire to be chosen as a Diffier's esteemed consort, the illustrious empress of the revered Istrian Empire. To be bestowed with such an extraordinary honor would unfurl a path paved with opulence, influence and the veneration of society, a realm where they could luxuriate in the embrace of untold riches, wield the scepter of authority, and revel in the adulation that naturally accompanies an exalted position. I cannot help but imagine the splendors that would befall the chosen one, murmured Lady Isabella, her eyes shimmering with a mixture of wonder and longing, to be draped in silk spun from the finest threads, adorned with jewels that rival the stars themselves, such a life would be nothing short of a fairy tale dream. Her companion, Lady Victoria, leaned in closer, her voice filled with a whisper of anticipation, and imagined the power that would be at her fingertips. With a mere gesture, the mightiest of nobles would bend to her will, and her voice would resonate through the corridors of the empire, shaping the course of history itself. As their words intertwined with the air, Lady Amelia, a young and starry-eyed noblewoman, interjected with a sigh, Oh, to be the one to capture the emperor's heart, to become the center of his world. It would be the pinnacle of fulfillment, the realization of all our dreams within the realm of nobility. Nods of agreement rippled through the small gathering, each lady harboring her own aspirations, her own secret fantasies of ascending to such heights. Their gazes lingered on Adifir, a figure of irresistible charisma and unparalleled might, as they envisioned themselves as the fortunate recipient of his affection and devotion. In these whispered conversations, the noblewomen discovered solace and companionship. United in their shared yearning for a life intertwined with the extraordinary destiny that awaited the chosen one. For within the depths of their hearts, they knew that becoming a Diffier's cherished partner would grant them a coveted place in the annals of history, forever etching their names among the luminaries of noble society. In the midst of emotions and whispered longings, the royal banquet buzzed with a blend of admiration, jealousy, and silent acceptance. The impact of this announcement weighed heavily on the hearts of those gathered reshaping their dreams and reshuffling the threads of their ambitions. Previously, Adifir had been deeply afraid of revealing his engagement to the esteemed goddess of alchemy. He dreaded the potential backlash from her devoted followers and fervent admirers, knowing that his life could be in grave danger if his connection to her was exposed. However, as time went on and Adifir ascended to unprecedented levels of power and influence, his once prevailing fears dissolved, replaced by an unwavering confidence. He had reached a pinnacle of invulnerability where the concerns of anyone, from this continent, or the farthest reaches of the other five continents, held no sway over him. With an imposing presence befitting his status as an emperor, Adifir addressed the gathered assembly, his voice brimming with authority, Ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to introduce my second fiancée, the esteemed princess of the ethereal empire, Alicia Osborne. She is revered as the goddess of wealth. His words resonated through the grand hall stirring a collective reaction among the assembled nobles. Some struggled to maintain their composure, their legs feeling unsteady beneath them, while others felt as though they had stumbled upon a bewitching illusion. A profound disbelief gripped their hearts, almost compelling them to exclaim in astonishment. However, they wisely suppressed their urge, fully aware of the dire consequences that awaited anyone who dared disrupt the solemnity of the moment. Indeed, to raise one's voice in defiance before the emperor, the embodiment of power and sovereignty, would be the epitome of foolishness. Such audacity would surely incur the wrath of Adifir, a force of nature capable of reducing the defiant to nothingness. Thus, faced with this overwhelming revelation, the assembled nobles opted for silence, understanding that preserving their own well-being was the wisest course of action. As Adifir's words hung in the air, a deep silence enveloped the gathered nobility, 
broken only by soft gasps and murmurs that escaped the stunned onlookers. Emotions surged within their hearts, revealing their vulnerability. Lady Evelyn, once filled with joy, now showed her shock by clasping her hand to her chest, her eyes widening in disbelief. The goddess of wealth? How is this possible? She exclaimed, her voice trembling with a mix of surprise and envy. Lord Henry, known for his wit and sharp tongue, struggled to find words, his face contorting with a blend of resentment and sadness. To think she, the epitome of wealth, will rise to such heights with a diffier, he muttered under his breath, unable to hide the bitterness in his voice. Lady Charlotte, her delicate features now touched by a veil of sadness, lowered her gaze, burdened by unfulfilled desires. Oh, how I wished it were me, she whispered, her voice tinged with sorrow and envy. Similar sentiments filled the room, as the nobles wrestled with their unrequited longings. Some attempted to conceal their disappointment behind forced smiles and feigned congratulations, while others sought solace in whispered conversations that betrayed their hidden sorrows. Do you see how fate can be cruel? Lady Evelyn confided in her confidant, her voice tinged with desolation. To think Alicia, blessed with wealth and beauty, has won a Diffier's heart. It feels like the gods conspired against us. Lady Charlotte, barely audible, confided in a trusted companion, her eyes clouded by a mix of sadness and envy. I had hoped my own charms would capture Adifir's attention. Alas, my dreams were in vain. Witnessing Alicia, the goddess of wealth, ascend to such heights, is a bitter pill to swallow. And so, the noble figures, once full of dreams and aspirations, found themselves shrouded in melancholy. Their hearts grappled with the reality that Adifir's affections were now bestowed upon Alicia Osborne, the goddess of wealth. Though they tried to hide their disappointment, the shadows of jealousy and unfulfilled desires danced behind their somber gazes, quietly echoing the unspoken whispers of longing that resonated within their noble souls. Before tomorrow ends, I really hope we can reach the 600 golden tickets mark. For each 100 golden tickets one chapter of 2,000 words by tomorrow itself. This is day before yesterday's pending chapter. I will try to upload two chapters for yesterday as well. Yesterday I was too tired to write. And it was Eid. On that occasion I would also like to wish all the Muslim readers.